Get ready to open up your weak core as an Omnibar because we've got some new additions to the broken abilities you need to be tracking. Today, we're going to cover some of the strongest spells in the meta, explaining how they work and what you can do to counter them. But this time around, we won't just cover DPS abilities, but instead mix in some healer spells that are borderline busted. So sit back as we simplify the new meta in Dragonflight Season 1. We will start with two evoker abilities, and luckily the first one is preservation only. This is basically divine him on steroids. It's a juiced up AoE heal that can be used in different forms of CC. The tooltip says stuns, fears, or silences, but it can even be used when in freezing trap or ring of frost, which aren't even in those categories. This is just the beginning of how weird this spell actually is. The cast can't be normally interrupted, but it can be stopped by some, but not all, incapacitates and disorients like blinding sleep, dragon's breath, and, well, incapacitating roar, of course. Here, for instance, the communion cast is cancelled the moment the evoker gets feared. Again, it can be used while feared, but it doesn't make the evoker immune to fear. Now the confusing part. It cannot be interrupted with gouged. But why? Isn't gouged an incapacitate? Well, yes. But for some unknown reason, Gouge is somehow classified as a stun? What the f is going on? But we are guessing that this spell is high on Blizzard's nerf list, or at the very least will be fixed to be less buggy. But whenever you play against an Evoker, always anticipate that at least one of your goes might get ruined by an Emerald Communion. If you play Mage or Druid, you're in luck because both Polymorph and Cyclone can prevent it from channeling, so rely on those and other in cap DRs first to have a counter ready when needed. Next up, we have Nullifying Shroud, which is available to both Evoker specs. Remember that good old fastidious Resolve Trinket from Shadowlands? Or what about pre-nerf Holy Ward? Ah yes, good times, right? Well, Nullifying Shroud is basically both of these at the same time, but somehow even better. That's because it provides immunity to 3 CC spells for 30 seconds. In the toolkit of a healer, this is incredibly strong, since it means being able to immune crucial CC chains that would otherwise force out a PvP trinket. It can be cast right out of the gates for 30 seconds of CC immunity in the opener, or even in the middle of a game once its cooldown comes back up. Together, that means 60 seconds worth of partial CC immunity and under a 2 minute window. Luckily though, there are some specific forms of counterplay. For one, the nullifying buff is magic, meaning it can actually be dispelled, which should be your first line of counterplay if there is an offensive dispel on your team. Especially spell steal, since it will completely strip off all buffs from the enemy evoker. If this isn't an option, then the next best option is to use spammable CC to remove all three stacks. Here, spells like Cyclone, Polymorph, Fear, and Cheap Shot are all great options if they are available. Obviously, it is very frustrating to have to sit there spamming three casts just to remove one buff. But hey, it will get nerfed eventually, right? And finally, as a very niche form of counterplay, rogues can actually sap off each stack at the start of the game, assuming the evoker doesn't get combat. Better evokers know this, so sometimes they will cast nullifying and then immediately deep breath in the center of the map to get combat. This will deal AoE damage and providing complete CC immunity while they are in the air, so just be careful not to get hit out of stealth and then just wait out the animation to triple sap, having your team avoid the deep breath in order to prevent combat. If you're watching this thinking all of this is news to you, these are the types of things we cover in our new Master in Minutes courses exclusively at SkillCap.com. We've streamlined years worth of pro player experience into binge worthy videos for every class, teaching you some of the advanced tech of your spec. These go along with our revamped class courses, which teach you how to deal rank 1 level damage or healing in easily digestible guides that are specifically designed to put you ahead of the competition in the new meta. We're so confident our guides work that we even offer a money back guarantee if you don't gain at least 400 rating while actively using our website. Visit the discount link below to learn more. Moving along, we're sure you've encountered a few hurricanes of imps, dogs, and pit lords this season thanks to the demo warlock ability Nether Portal. It can be hard to notice this spell with 1 million nameplates on your screen, and unfortunately this ability can summon even more with every demon it spawns while active. In order to summon these demons, the warlock has to spend soul shards, which might require them to cast Hand of Gul'dan. This means you should definitely prioritize lining or interrupting this spell when Nether Portal is active, especially since it locks them on both fire and shadow. The second reason this is important is because once the portal ends, it will summon a pit lord, who will run after you like a very angry Brock Lesnar ready to suplex half of your health bar. Fortunately, the Pit Lord can be rooted, which should be your first line of defense when flowcharting your way around this ability. Otherwise, you may need to simply kite with mobility cooldowns, rely on other forms of micro CC, or be ready to trade a defensive if needed. 
Next up, we have two different Windwalker monk cooldowns with both Serenity and Storm, Earth, and Fire. Now, you won't be playing against both of these at the same time since they are exclusive to one another, but their purpose is exactly the same, and that is to hit you so hard that you have no choice but to check your details death log. Both of these share one form of counterplay, and it involves trading a defensive cooldown. Seriously, we should have all learned from Shadowlands that there's no point in being greedy. With a spec as explosive as Windwalker, you need to trade defensives when you see these abilities, no exceptions. Storm, Earth, and Fire has a bit more nuance in how you can play around it. Because it summons mirror images of the monk, it means AoE CC is quite effective. This includes AoE roots, fears, incaps, or stuns. Whatever multi-target CC you have, it should be thrown into the clones as soon as possible. In any case, please hear us out, there is no reason to ever be greedy against a Windwalker Monk. CC the images, or get ready to trade as soon as possible. Next up, we got one damage ability shared by both Elemental and Resto Shamans, Stormkeeper. Yes, even Resto Shamans have a threatening damage ability, with Stormkeeper allowing them to hit over 100k with Lightning Bolt as a healer. Anyway, Stormkeeper requires shamans to hard cast the spell, and since it is on the nature school, it is a high value interrupt, locking them out of wind shear, hex, damage, and healing. This is why better shamans will generally run out of LOS to precast Stormkeeper in order to go back into the fight with two instant lightning bolts that have a slew of modifiers, including Sky Fury Totem, which makes the damage extra deadly if it crits. So if you see this buff after a shaman has run LOS to Stormkeeper, get ready for some damage. Since you can't dispel the buff, your best course of action is to either run to a pillar to avoid the shaman, or trade a damage reduction cooldown if you absolutely cannot avoid the incoming damage. Remember that elemental shamans have an increased crit modifier, and with a 1 minute cooldown on Stormkeeper, it means efficient 1 minute CDs like Roar of Sacrifice are usually more than enough to survive its damage. Again though, just like Windwalker cooldowns, Stormkeeper is definitely something you should respect, even against resto shamans. Speaking of trading as early as possible, you will need to do that with Deathmark, and, well, Shiv too, but we will explain that later. In case you missed it, Vendetta is gone, so it's time to make a custom cooldown tracker for Deathmark, which you can do with Omnibar and the spell ID on screen now. Deathmark will duplicate all bleeds and poisons, which means Asa Rogues can have 2 stacks of improved Garrets, and even 10 total stacks of Wound Poison. This makes class-specific counterplay like Mending Bandage, Cauterizing Flame, or even Blessing of Protection good trades into this ability. But also the reason why many pro players will probably be Dwarf in upcoming tournaments, since Stone Form also completely counters this ability. As far as Shiv is concerned, this is a spell that you should already be familiar with from Shadowlands. Of course, you already know that Shiv applies Hematoxin, reducing all healing taken by 35%. What is equally important is knowing that this ability is almost always combined with Kidney Shot, meaning if you see the Shiv debuff on yourself, you have a very small window to pre-use an ability like Bladestorm, Port, Bear Form, or basically anything that can avoid the follow-up Kidney Shot or increase your bulk. Moving on, we have Arcane Surge, which is the new mage cooldown that replaced Arcane Power. Like other wizard cooldowns on our list so far, this ability has a cast time and will represent the start of the Arcane Mage's burst sequence. If you want to understand what this ability feels like from the mage's perspective, it is something like this. Anyway, because it can be interrupted, any kick should be your first line of defense when LOS isn't readily available. Remember that locking a mage on arcane is super high value since it shuts down most of their damage, CC, and utility. Otherwise, if the cast is allowed to channel, it will generally be followed by some other cooldowns, including Touch the Magi, Radiant Spark, and Presence of Mind. When all of these are combined together, the mage will deal huge damage. Radiant Spark should also be interrupted, as well as the arcane missiles cast that are usually thrown into this burst sequence. Again, interrupting any arcane spell during this time will be important, as it will prevent lots of downstream damage. Avoiding follow-up damage is important, since you never want to find yourself low against an arcane mage. This is due to the slew of arcane barrage modifiers, which essentially turns the spell into an execute. If you see 10 stacks of arcane harmony and are below 35% HP, you are basically dead. This simply means you need to do whatever you can to prevent dropping into execute range. On the topic of getting executed, we have some Shadow Priest cooldowns worth respecting. These days, most priests are playing the new Dark Ascension talent instead of Void Form. Dark Ascension is a true burst cooldown, increasing all the non-dot damage they deal while active. This means Mind Blast, Mind Spike, and Mind Games, which can all be interrupted of course, but also includes Shadow Word Death, which can now be used to deal execute level damage regardless of the target's HP if the Shadow Priest has the Death Speaker buff. 
Dark Ascension will also buff Shadow Fiend or Mind Bender damage too. Luckily though, both of these minions can be CC'd and AoE roots are exceptionally good at stopping some of their pressure. While the combination of any of these abilities is happening, the Priest might commit Psy Fiend, which isn't scary for the damage it deals, but instead for the healing reduction it applies. Luckily though, Psy Fiend can be killed and has a relatively small amount of HP, making it an easy threat to take out for most specs. Better Priests will use Power Ward Shield instantly on Psy Fiend, so a quick dispel might also be needed to quickly take it down. Moving along, we have a low-key Feral ability that is worth playing around if you want to help your healer out. It's called Primal Wrath, and it's simply an AoE finisher that will apply rip to all targets within 8 yards. On its surface, this might not seem like a big deal, until you actually take a look at details and see how much damage this single ability is able to do. Now, you don't need to go around trading cooldowns just to deal with some bleed damage, but what you should do is spread out. Whenever possible, avoid stacking against any Feral Druid team, since you will be feeding them free damage. To wrap up our list, we have two distinct Resto Druid abilities that you definitely need to play around, especially in Solo Shuffle. The first is Tranquility. By now you should already know that Trank is basically a bubble thanks to the Keeper of the Grove talent. This means the Druid will be immune to all incoming damage in CC while it's channeling. Some knockback effects, including Ring of Peace, are actually able to interrupt the channel, unless the Druid is playing with the appropriately named Inner Peace talent. In any case, if the Resto Druid has a combination of Trinket and Tranquility ready, you should really Really avoid overcommitting offensive CDs to try and kill them, since a simple trinket trank will block your kill instantly. Finally, we need to cover Scenarian Ward, since a lot of DPS don't seem to notice this buff, especially in Solo Shuffle. When this buff is rolling with a full set of Hots and Adaptive Swarm, it is incredibly unlikely that you will kill through the combined healing. Remember that Resto Druids have some of the best single target HPS in game, but can struggle dealing with multi-target pressure and swaps. So if you see Sen Ward on a target, just swap off. There's no need to try and truck through its healing, unless you really have a lot of damage. Alright guys, that about wraps it up for this one. We're going to do even more videos dedicated to countering broken abilities, so let us know in the comments below which ones you would like us to cover next. As always, we want to thank you all for watching. See you soon.